Community Matters here on a given Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And the magic word of the day is Brad Coates. That's two words, but yeah. <laughs> Close enough. Brad's an attorney here at Pioneer Plaza. Brad has been involved in matrimonial law since I think it was 1450 or so. Something like that. Yeah, something yeah, like the that. The place to see an age. And his firm is uh, really big on the scene of uh, matrimonial law. But Brad is also a philosopher. And, and Brad is a, what do we call it, social. A social commentator. Is that fair? Well, I've turned, I turned into that to yeah. some degree. I wrote this Divorce with Decency book thinking it was going to be a divorce handbook. And then it turns out that really what's changing so fast is society uh, more than even divorce yeah. laws are changing. This is that the society. That's the book. Can, can we look like, at that book? Can we get a as, cover as of that? luck would have it, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting book. And these discussions that we have are really interesting. So today we're going to talk about cohabitation as an alternative to marriage. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, one of the reasons we should talk about that is that it's gaining momentum over, over our lifetimes and probably even quicker now. Um, they have numbers on it. Do we know how many people are cohabiting instead of getting married? I don't know if I've got the exact numbers of that, but I can tell you that cohabitation has just taken off like crazy. Um, you know, it's... it's uh, and it's not just cohabitation, it's basically all the different alternate approaches to what used to be known as the nuclear family. Mm. You know, when you, and, when you and I grew up in the, in the good old 1950s, a mere 4 million people lived alone. 1950, only 4 million people lived alone. Everybody else lived in nuclear families, extended families, whatever. Only about 9% of households were, were single, uh, you know, loners. Nowadays, according to the 2011 census, People who live alone are now 33 million Americans. That makes up 28% of all U.S. households. Mm. So people are living alone. People are living in, 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 uh, in you know, cohabitating, um, you know, living together with, with, uh, with uh, their, quote, life partner. You don't have to get married anymore. You can just declare your life partner. I mean, think of how much of a change that is. Used to be that in order to qualify for benefits, pension, health insurance, stuff like that, you had to be somebody's spouse if you wanted spousal benefits. Now, you can just fill in and say life partner and bang, you get all the same benefits. So, you know, why bother to get married? Let me ask you a normative question, which, you know, it, it, in my mind, it keeps popping up, uh, given the numbers and the change. Is this a good thing for the country? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I mean, it's definitely the thing. It's, it's what's going to keep happening. I mean, you know, Brad Coates and Jay, Fidel, Jay Fidel are not going to start or stop it or have much of an impact on it. Yeah. All we can do is dissect it a little bit. But obviously, if you get a situation where this is happening so exponentially and so fast, it's almost like smoking before the Surgeon's General report came out and said, hey, this is dangerous. I mean, you know, we're, we're embarking on Half, you know, 40 to 50 percent of all the kids in, in the country are now being born out of wedlock. 50 percent for women That's under huge. 30, 40 percent nationwide. That's not good. Well, it's, you know, it doesn't seem well, good to we offer this style style types. If you're born into a marriage, then people are feel whether it's obligated, you know, whether it's um, the right, the correct conclusion or not, people feel obligated to take care of you. I mean, the marriage sort of calls on you to do that. And society called on you to do it. Society, and religion called you to do it. But you, if you're not married and you have a kid out of wedlock, it's not the same thing, is it? And, and that kid has a, stands a much better chance of being, um, you know, with only one of his parents or none of his parents. Right? Yeah. Well, and I do have some stats on that, just so we don't sound like old fogies commenting. I mean, you know, now less than one half of all American children live in traditional intact nuclear families, less than half of the kids. We're the, now the world's leader in fatherless families here in America. Just over 40% of America's children do not live with their biological fathers. Meanwhile, and this is an amazing statistic, every time a new partner rotates in or out of a parent's life, so you've got a single mom who's dating, single dad who's, who's dating a secretary instead of his ex-wife. Look at all the movies coming out of Hollywood, half of them That's exactly right down that And road. they almost endorse all that. Yeah. So, that the adolescent kids' problems increase by 12% every time you bring in a new partner. Interesting. So mom comes home and says, you know, hey, John, you're going you're gonna to love my new partner, Melvin. And, you know, John doesn't love Melvin. He kind of misses his dad, yeah. and he starts acting out. And then after Melvin comes, you know, Martin, and after Martin comes, you know, Michael and whatever, and that's just the end. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's a profile in, in literature. It's, uh, it's the angry kid, the kid out of control, who says to this person who comes into the, the, the household, you're not unit, my, father. You're not my dad. Right, yeah. There it is. And, and by definition, he's ticked off. Yeah, that, that's right. And 
What you have now is a million children a year being affected by divorce. And then the question is, you know, how's that, how's that what's the ripple effect of that? There's a, there's a lady psychologist, uh, sociologist named Dr. Judith Wallerstein. She did a famous follow-up study on the children of divorce, and she went back and interviewed these kids 20 or 30 years after they're no longer kids, after their parents divorce, and said, you know, how did your parents' divorce affect you? And uh, across the board, they, they hated it. Only one in 10 said they felt any sense of relief after their parents' divorce. Otherwise, they would have rather their parents had stayed together and fought. You know, they all, they all, it's always what the parents say because they feel like it's good for them. You know, dad wants to run off with his secretary or mom with their personal trainer or whatever. So because it's, you know, seems like a positive thing for the parent, they transpose it to think, well, this would be good for the kids. They didn't want to hear me and, and dad yeah. fight all the time. Yeah. Kids would have There's much something rather, really selfish about that's that. That's totally it? selfish. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the kids would have rather heard the parents stay together and fight than lose them, either one. They well, don't want like to lose to, either parent. I would like to examine with you, the, you know, the causations here. There are multiple causations and try to figure out what has caused this and what will be causing, you know, uh, an increase later, which I believe will happen. But before we do that, I want to ask you one other question. How does this, you know, you're a matrimonial lawyer. You're a, you know, I don't want to tell you anything you don't know, Brad. You're a matrimonial lawyer. With no matrimony anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's no matrimony. What about Lee Marvin? Is he around? Is he alive? Is he with us? <laughs> I mean, are there claims possible in a non-marital household? Well, in Hawaii, we don't have common law marriage, and we don't have, uh, we don't have that sort of a claim. You would have to have um, you know, some sort of an independent contractual problem to, to say that. Say you were joint tenants in a That'd house. That'd be a writing, too. Yeah, that, and so it's not, you, just living with somebody does not give you, not give you rights in their, in their property. Although, ironically, if you've been married five years, but you lived together five years before that, Sometimes they'll bootstrap on the prior period of cohabitation, but just cohabitation alone does not uh, does not do it. So, the, so the, but you you gave stats already. Doesn't this affect your practice? The number you you can't have as many divorces uh, if you don't have as many marriages. Well, <laughs> and I'm fortunately I'm almost as old as you are, and I'm going to be retiring before too long. So it's not uh, no, but it is definitely it is definitely a problem. A uh, problem for divorce lawyers, uh, you know, and automation may be a problem for lawyers. Period. But definitely. Uh, the front end of the pipeline, and people are always saying, you know, you know, how's the divorce business? It's really, how's the marriage business? It's the front end of the pipeline that, you know, because we're, yeah. the Coates and Fry firm is well known. We're, you know, we're going to have plenty of business if there's people getting divorced. What happens is it gets replaced by other areas. Paternity, the paternity calendar for kids uh, born out of wedlock is expanding exponentially. Oh, yeah. The domestic abuse calendar is expanding exponentially. Oh. Because, again, stuff like we talked about, you know, society and religion and, you know, you know, contemporary social groupings, you know, frowned on, you know, you know, people, men beating on women, whatever, and, you know, and it, it, kind, it kind of reined it in. Um, now, you know, if everybody's just sort of living together and nobody even knows who's married or who's a real couple anymore anyway, and the neighbors don't aren't exactly sure who's coming and going, and, you know, there's less of those kind of factors reining it in. So, so and, and there's other factors that are causing the increase in domestic violence and, and the increase in recognizing domestic violence. And when you say violence, you mean criminal violence that goes to the yeah. criminal court? Well, it goes, it goes to the TRO court, the temporary restraining order first. You get restraining orders against people. Yeah. And sometimes that gets abused because that gets used in, in custody cases because you want to get a leg up in custody. In sure. order to avoid it's with just, otherwise, uh, otherwise the court has a predilection for joint, joint custody. And people who don't like that sometimes file TROs. And people who are getting hit for real file TROs. So that, that's expanded tremendously. I hire criminal prosecutors, former prosecutors and public defenders for my firm now. Oh, really? Because they have so much experience yeah, in the area. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I, you know, I sat on a jury uh, when, uh, when they found out my politics. And believe it or not, they were, they were permitted to ask me my politics. Uh, they challenged me off peremptorily. But it was an abuse case. And I'm saying, well, gosh, how, you know, how did this happen? How did a family living together with a child and all that get into abuse? It's like, it's like I, you know, in my day, in our day, this it just didn't happen. You, you know, it was, it was hideous to even think about it. And yeah. it, it happens much more regularly now, and it happens here in the land of Aloha. Yeah. It's pretty common, actually. It's, it's common amongst the military. It's common amongst some of the ethnic groups. It's not, uh, it's not at all unusual anymore yeah, in yeah. Hawaii. Well, let's talk about the factors. Let's talk about you know, all the causation factors and how they, where they come from, how they have grown, what causes them, and how they work together, you know, how they interact to provide a, uh, you know, a troubled stew, so to speak. 
Well, what we're going to have going forward is we're going to have a new uncharted territory where the traditional nuclear family is far less prevalent and other stuff's going to spring up in its place. And we don't know how that how that's going to work. I mean, you know, gay marriage. Great. Um, you know, I mean, great for the participants, for, for everybody let's get to live the life they want. But is it great for procreation and, and continuing society? You know, that's again, that's a sort of a jump ball. Nobody's nobody's really got the answers to any of these kind of questions. Um, there's a lot of marriage killer factors that I can just go right through them. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I know you like to be a little more freestyle and you can stop me whenever you I want. I do but, indeed. <laughs> but the, you know, the internet has created more options for more partners. There's no need to settle oh, you mean on matching, anyone. Matching, yeah, matching. Match.com, all that stuff. So why get married if you can find a new partner on the internet in 10 minutes? Um, well, you know, the other thing I'd like to add to that, and maybe you can comment on it, is it's not only that you can find a new partner in 10 minutes with these matching, you know, uh, matching sites and matching technology, you can lose the partner in yeah. 10 minutes too. <laughs> Good point. I mean, the, the, you know, the big underlying statement there is it comes and goes because as fast as you can find partner A, you can find a replacement in partner B, same yeah. way. So that works in favor of shorter term revolving relationships and the accompanying mindset that goes with that rather than longer term committed relationships. Yeah. So that's one. Sex, obviously a, a huge factor. In the old days, you know, when you and I were growing up, if you wanted to have sex, you got married. I mean, literally, you had to, you know, had to get married to your college girlfriend or whatever. And, and people did. They married their college girlfriend. Now the age for first, uh, for first marriages is like 29 for guys and 27 for women, whereas it used to be 23 and 21. Yeah. Um, so that's a the point. They're postponing marriage. Um, you know, sex is readily available so, well, outside that work? of America. You know, I mean, I, 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 not in that generation, obviously, but so I can hook up. I can go to a bar on a given Thursday night and hook up, and I can have sex that night and never see her again, or see her on a, you know, on a rotating basis if you want. She's in my black book. How does that affect this relationship? I mean, it sounds like sex without love, sex without any commitment, sex without commitment. Is that what you're talking about? Well, that seems to be what the millennials in particular seem to be uh, headed that way. Um, ironically, our generation had more sex uh, than some of these subsequent generations, uh, quantitative, quali quantitatively. Um, but the, the millennials seem to like the, the hookup approach and the, you know, and the sex without, uh, without commitment sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, then they find the right ones. Um, there's all well, kinds of... Theoretically. I mean, the theoretically. It's not clear exactly how... Finding the right one is affected by sex without commitment for a period of time. Uh, and, and by the way, I just 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 for the footnote, I believe that sex with commitment is better sex. That's just my view. Well, that's been that's not just for you. That's traceable. I mean, all the all the you know, sex therapists will tell you that the more you know your partner's body and the more comfortable you are in that situation, the better sex is going to be. Yeah. So there's no question about that. Um, another marriage killer factor: religion. You know, religion was, you know, a major, major cornerstone of America. Uh, it's a, marriage was essentially a religious institution, but now everybody's tracking the decline of, of religion. Uh, de, de, you know, atheism, atheism and, uh, and uh, agnosticism way up, you know, Catholicism way down. Yeah. Um, and Europe, including Europe, right? You just took a trip. That's right. You must, you must have seen the same thing where people do not show up in church. Uh, religion is not it's part big, of their beautiful lives. cathedrals with nobody in empty them. all yeah. the time empty yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. no another factor recession the millennials grew up right during the, the throes of the recession they've had there's some amazing statistics on millennials here that I've got that is kind of a, a deviation but this is astounding when I I, I love statistics and I mean, I'm always doing these new books so millennials suffered a 68 percent drop in real net worth from 1984 to 2009 and 24% of 18 to 30 year olds have moved back in with their parents at least once to save cash, the old go live in your parents garage thing. The average net worth of the average millennial is below $8,000. Can you imagine a net worth below $8,000? Incredible. Well, it's okay if your parents are putting the food on the table. Yeah, I guess, but yeah. Student debt now 1.6 trillion. Um, it's just, it's been really, really tough for these millennials. So, they, so they, can't, they can't even afford to, you know, Take a girl out to dinner, much, you know, for maybe for anything other than pizza. Get her to uh, pay. Yeah, get her to pay. <laughs> um, and, you know, much less, and, you know, have a home or a car to, to, to drive her to or a car to um, start a family or, you know, buy a home. You know, they're, they're out of luck on a lot of this stuff. And well, that, let me add that, you know, cars seem to be the first priority rather than the home. 
Maybe it's always been thus, you know, but you, you find, I find, these young people, they'll spend an incredible amount of money on a fancy car, but they won't think about buying a home. Yeah. It's just out of their reach and out of their thought process. Well, home ownership's out of the, out of the, out of the spectrum for a lot of, a lot of, it was always like, hard in Hawaii. It was always hard. Brutal in but Hawaii. Way harder now. Absolutely. And brutal. The other, one of the other big factors is the rise of what I call the she economy. And I've talked about this on your shows before. The rapid rise in education, career, and monetary advancement for women, which makes them far less dependent on men. Um, it widens the gender gap. I mean, it used to be that, you know, that each gender knew what they were doing. Now the women are out earning the men and, and, uh, and taking charge of their own lives. The major change for women is that they now you know, want to marry out of love uh, instead, of, instead of out of necessity. It used to be that you know, dad was the only one bringing home the paycheck. Mom was raising the kids. You know, wife, and even an unhappy wife couldn't get away because she, she didn't have the financial resources to do it. turned upside down. Now, now the women are out earning the guys half the time. Yeah. They're getting more advanced degrees in, in uh, college and, 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 and in uh, higher, degree, higher education. Yeah. There's more female lawyers and doctors coming out. I mean, the, the yeah. women are smarter. And they support their husbands. Yeah. Who become Mr. Mom. Yeah. I mean, frequently. I know, I know a number of families where that is that's happening. That's actually the good thing is when guys get in touch, you know, more in touch with their parenting skills and do that. Of course, that's, that's positive. But it's a, again, it's a major change. And it certainly allows women the ability to cut and run that they didn't used to have in the 1950s or 1960s. Right. And, it, and it's interesting to note that it, it, from a divorce lawyer's perspective, women file two-thirds of all divorces, in, not only in Hawaii, but in the U.S. Has it changed? Was it something else before? It's, it's been pretty consistent, and it may, may now be going up. Um, but it's always the women that seem to be the most dissatisfied. Guys will stay in even a bad marriage as long as they're getting fed regularly, as long as they can sit in their lazy boy lounger and watch sports. So, you know, the, to them, that's a good marriage. Where, whereas women want this bizarre concept of communication, whatever the hell that is. They, they, want, you know, they want to be able we'll to have talk. have to do another show on that one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That would take a whole other show. Yeah, so, so even the, the marital institution, the marital relationship, or, you know, the cohabitation relationship, it's different now because of the economics. Because you, you don't necessarily find this dependence by women. As a matter of fact, you might find dependence by men. How about that? Yeah. yeah. They, they are dependent economically on their wives. Not just economically. Guys, guys need women more than women need guys. You heard it here. It's going to be on the final exam. It's a very important point. Well, when I do a divorce for a 60-year-old, 50- or 60-year-old guy, First thing he wants to know is, you know, where can I find a new wife? I mean, you know, with, guys will get remarried if, after falling divorce within three years. Women, oftentimes, if they're 50 or 60 years old at the time of divorce, they're not going to get remarried at all. They just, they have no desire. They've been taking care of guys all their lives. They're, you they know, they're, do they're, they don't want to keep cooking and cleaning for loser guys. So women won't get, oftentimes won't get remarried at all. Younger women, maybe, uh, yes. Um, but um, once they've had the kids and gotten, what, you know, their biological determinative out of the way, then putting up with guys is tough. So, so they file for two-thirds of the divorces. They don't remarry nearly as fast. Uh, women are much more self-sufficient. They've got social groupings that start way, way earlier. You know, everything from the junior league and the PTA and the sororities and the book clubs. and what, You know, women have women friends. Guys' friends are, are basically made through team sports when they're going through college or the fraternity house or their office environment, the, you know, the junior partner wanting to become it's a senior the same partner. Thing. And then all of a sudden the guy turns 50 or 60 years old and he looks around and other than his golfing buddies, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have any social network at all. So guys have got to get with the program. That's really and, true. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, really, so this, this changes things dramatically. But what it points out also is that in our world today, um, and we can talk about other age groups, but if you're 50 or 60 and you're on your own, it's doable. It's doable. Oh, totally. You're not a miserable person. You're not, you know, you're going to fall down a well. You, you're, you can live. You can get along. Um, assuming your economics are acceptable, you can live by yourself without being married and without being in a cohabitation. Am I right? Yeah, totally right. This and is not always the case. You know, before a lot of, a lot of couples, a lot of individuals were scrambling to stay alive. Yeah. Well, and you didn't stay alive as long. So you figure, hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 55 years old. I'm going to be dead by 60 anyway. You know, I might as well just hang in there for a while in my same old marriage. Now, the expectation of all of us that grew up in the 60s, you know, you know, drug, sex, rock and roll, peace, love, personal freedom, 
uh, you know, we think we're going to extend that into our 80s. You know, I mean, I don't know who we're really kidding, Often but do. but and, and we do. So actually, baby boomers are the are, have got the highest rate of divorce now of, the, of any other cohort. They want another life. Yeah, I, mean, I, would just, I want to go back and having exactly what I wanted out of life, just the way I always have. I want it to just all fall into my lap. And it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's, it may not it's, be it's tra feasible, but it's, it's, tra it's traceable. It's traceable. And then. Boomers, they're on second or third marriages. They're not going to get remarried. So they may be the, one of the highest divorcing quadrants in, in society, but they're certainly not going to, they're not a heavy remarriage market because, you know, the woman loses her alimony if, she's, if she gets uh, from the first marriage, if she marries a second time. They lose some of their government benefits, et cetera, et cetera, and they lose a lot of their personal freedom. And why bother? Yeah. So, so you've named uh, probably eight or ten different factors, and they're not necessarily connected, you know, they don't, one doesn't trip off the other. Um, they're like independent uh, factors all happening at the same time. And uh, my question to you is, how do they interact? Um, how do they, you know, how do they create the porridge that we live in socially, uh, family-wise, uh, household-wise? Um, and, uh, you know, wh wh where, where, are they, where are they taking us? Uh, that's a hard that's question. That's the $64,000 yeah. million dollar yeah. question. Yeah. Because there's no roadmap for this for society. I mean, there, are, there are societies, like the, the, uh, the Scandinavian societies, uh, a lot of times women are raising, or s single women are raising their own kids there, um, and it seems to work out okay. Um, and uh, that's, it's kind of an accepted deal. Their social structures, uh, you know, they have daycare centers that, that pop up and take care of it. Um, how that's going to work out in, in inner cities of the, of the U.S., um, you know, with some of our minority communities where you got single moms trying to raise kids and, you know, you get the, the, the uh, unexpected uh, consequences of, uh, of, you know, a, a single mom gets more money in, in food stamps and government benefits than if she's, if she's got a, a, a live-in partner. So that, foster, that, that fosters them to continue that lifestyle instead of even trying to find a linkage. And, you know, who knows whether a nuclear family linkage is, is the right thing, but it seems to have... It seems like there is a, a benefit to having a male uh, role model, a consistent male role model, in a, in a, especially raising male children, in, a, in a, a cohesive, you know, family style unit. That seems to be kind of undeniable. And without that, you got societal problems. I mean, these kids, uh, kids that are raised by single moms, um, as hard as these single moms try, they, you know, they, they have, kids have more problems. Yeah. So we're going to have to figure our way around that as a society. Yeah, well, it's hard because I don't think anybody's really working on it except you and me right here. You know? Yeah. We're, We've almost got to solve it, not quite. It further. But a couple of things, you know, you mentioned inner cities and that, that's not only an economic, um, you know, um, dichotomy. It's, it's, it's also, a, it's a geographical dichotomy. And, and if you ask me cold, and I have no evidence on this, about whether these, um, what do we call it, interchangeable families, are greater on the West Coast in a West Coast culture or on the East Coast in the big cities on the East Coast, I would guess that the interchangeability is easier and thus more ubiquitous on the West Coast than the East Coast. Is there anything to that? What do you think? Well, I, you know, I'm raised on the West Coast and, uh, and you know, West Coast has always been the, you know, the American dream, go West young man. I mean, it's always been the more freestyle. You know, freestyle, yeah. liberal, whatnot. Um, although inner cities in, in, in the East Coast, affluent inner cities have probably got very similar problems. It's really the flyover state. I mean, we're watching. I mean, I've never seen this country be more polarized. We've got a bunch of people that believe in old-style American families, you know, white, middle-class, you know, nuclear families, you know, with, with a, a, t a central community, town-based focus. And we're tired of hearing about what all the elites are saying about on the coast. And, uh, and then we got the progressives on the coast that are driving their Teslas and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and you know, and they, they think they're the, the new wave. So it, we really have got, I mean, you know, look at what's happening politically in America. Yeah, well, that, you, take me, you took me to my last question. That is exactly where we need to go here in this discussion. So, okay, we have uh, Access Hollywood. You know, remember that, the bus, the bus thing with uh, Donald Trump back right. when? Um, and we have, you know, a kind of an, uh, an amoral uh, kind of approach that he has, and yet uh, a lot of his followers, his base are, they're, you know, supposedly moral. They they come from evang evangelist uh, communities and religious communities. And that's that's hard to put together. But I just wonder. Here's my uh, my you know my freewheeling question for you. Um, how does these how do these trends affect, uh, say, an election of a of a demagogue like Donald Trump? How, how do they affect politics today? 
Um, they got to they got to be they're not static. They're moving. They're dynamic, and they'll be at least as dynamic in the future. How do they affect American politics? Well, that may be above my pay grade, but but uh, you you definitely have got a very weird situation where you've got a guy like Donald Trump who is not exactly a bastion of truth, honor, morality, and you know and the American standards. Uh, in fact, he's kind of the opposite. And yet, all the people that believe in that see him as their savior, as compared to whatever they seem to view as being worse. Uh, you know, God forbid we should have a woman president. God forbid we should have a a, a, a progressive woman president. We you know. You know I, I, I can, I can only tell you one thing that is kind of interesting from you know, the, the studies I do, because I'm not a political science guy. Um, there is a definite phenomenon going on where there's a self-selecting out of, of quadrants of society. You're much more likely to get divorced, marry early, have kids early, get divorced if you are less than high school educate drop out before high school or just end at high school education if you're married go on to graduate degrees you're a doctor a lawyer an indian chief whatever and you find you find somebody else who's, who's introduced at somebody's wedding up you know on the hamptons or whatever all of a sudden you've got a more stable marriage and those marriages are so the separate the gap my point is the gap between the haves and the have-nots is widening in, in america actually the southeast is who is trump's big base they're actually having the tougher time, which is, which is what's, what's so counterintuitive about a lot of this, because they are, they're the ones that are getting divorced, trying to raise single kids, living in a trailer, you know, having a real difficult time, and yet they see Trump as being their, their guy, and, and, the, and the liberal elites um, who are doing much better, and they, and they can do better. I mean, it's getting worse. It used to be, and I'm sure you remember this, you know, you come in as a, as a partner in a big law firm, and you would maybe meet cute young, you know, secretary and think, oh, because guys are always more attracted viscerally to women. Oh, you know, she's pretty. And, you know, you know she, <laughs> next thing you know, you got a partner in law firm marrying a, a secretary or paralegal. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. That's another yeah. factor, isn't it? Yeah. Now the lawyers are marrying female lawyers and they're finding each other on, on dating sites. You can go on dating sites where you've got to be a certified millionaire to qualify and you can only search out other millionaires. So it's not just, you know, the, the goofy ones, the Tinder about, you know, who's going to put out tonight or tomorrow night. Yeah. It's actually a way to self-select the elites, finding more elites and sticking with the elites and the have-nots getting stuck in this, in, this, in this bottomless pit, stuck to the tar baby. Yeah, and in that law firm, these days, no lawyer is going to date a secretary. That's much too dangerous, and his partners would tell him, do That's not right. do that. That's right. That's right. Um, that creates all kinds of problems for him, the law firm, and so forth, and... Gee, uh, God knows what happens uh, in that scenario. Well, thank you so much, Brad. It's always great to talk to you. I get a, kick out, I get so a kick out of talking to you, Jay. Yeah. They're, they're interesting, uh, interesting topics and, and prospects with, uh, with questionable solutions. So, yeah. <laughs> Brad Coates. Hello. Questionable solutions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Bye.